Thank you. The Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by Jagermeister. Give your beer a shot this summer with an ice cold shot of Jagermeister. Talking more soccer today, obviously, because we're presented by Jagermeister. This is what we do. First day, well, actually not first day, second day technically of the World Cup. The big DraftKings slate, the upcoming Friday, so June, I want to say, Paul, June what? June 15th, three game slate, so six teams to choose from. I don't know any of these names, so if I try to say them, and I didn't really get the luck of the draw here. We got like Morocco, Iran, Egypt. I'm not going to say these names properly. So. Yeah, they didn't They didn't give you France. No, yeah, we didn't get the good ones. Davis Maddox here, by the way, to, to help me actually out with this, with some DraftKings strategy, how to pronounce the names, the guys to pick, all that fun stuff. Maybe we'll even get into some actual like World Cup chat afterwards too and you like france to advance because you love france so much apparently I, I mean i definitely do think france will advance but yeah we should definitely get into it i actually did a, a world cup preview of like all the groups on uh on my show so if anyone wants a little bit more information on all the teams they could definitely check that out as well so yeah here's the thing though if you're going to promote your show you got to say the name of the show and where they can find it uh, it's called the Tate Cast. You can find it on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever, or just find it linked on my Twitter. And hopefully, we're gonna have Pat Mayo on the show pretty soon. Very soon. I got some U.S. Open stuff, World Cup stuff to get through, and then I shall be there. I've been really enjoying it so far, by the way. The Dink one was the best one so far. I actually like the Matt Herman one from the other day too. The Dink one got the best response thus far, which is kind of helpful because I didn't really know what I exactly wanted to do with the show when I started it, but I was just tired of not having a podcast, which is, uh, that's why I started doing fantasy in general when I was like 19, because I was just tired of how bad everyone was at fantasy and I wanted to be able to spout off. So it's a, it's a similar process for me. So, so now you have a podcast where you rarely talk about fantasy. Right, yeah. I mean, I just want to talk. I'd love to talk. Well, here's the thing. I mean, we don't have enough podcasts, so we needed more into the market, so oh. that's why you had to come up. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, if you want to look at a market that's definitely undersaturated, you need to look at the field of, of free podcasts. That's definitely a market that uh, just really, it's it's begging to be exploited at the moment. Well, I mean, listen, I, I listen to a ton of podcasts, and I always find myself running out of them, so the more I can add to the list, the, the better I have. Weekends are tough for podcasts, by the way. Oh, they're hor once you get once you get to Sunday, like it's uh, for me, it's Sunday, and I'll be trying to like do laundry or kind of clean up the kitchen or something, and I'll be like, I have nothing left to listen to. Yeah, that's why sometimes like this this one dropping on a Saturday, so you know it, the market's all to myself on Saturday. But unfortunately, it's soccer, it's me, and the people that listen to me probably don't like soccer too much. But if you are here, you're here for some strategy. Davis rules at DraftKings Soccer, so we'll get into this. Let's hit some strategy to begin with because. You know, I already have the full World Cup preview show from earlier in the week. You can go check that out. Jordan Cooper was on, explain some of his strategy. But I want to know yours. Like, if I'm going to fill out a lineup, especially on a slate like this, where there's only three games, what should I be doing in GPPs? So the first thing I need to communicate to the listener is that even if you are a fish at soccer, <laughs> like you don't know that much about soccer, I still think that if you even follow some basic soccer strategy tenant you will be able to have a profitable world cup and also DraftKings is really going to be promoting this like we have this big gbp on the the first uh real day with three games but there's going to be a lot of this they're going to be running big guaranteed prize pool tournaments for showdown slates when the big teams like germany brazil or france happen to be the last game of the afternoon um, there's going to be a lot of softer action at low stakes head-to-heads and in 50 50s um, this is, it's just going to be, even if right now, you know, we're sitting here on Friday, June 8th, recording this. If you don't know anything about soccer, you don't know, uh, the people on these teams. I still think if you are willing to commit yourself and put a little bit of work in, you will be able to make pretty good ROI over the next month. If you try hard enough and really dedicate yourself to honestly even learning some of the basic strategy tenets all right well first off like I, I find information gathering like if i didn't know anything about football and i just and i knew like injuries are really important and i just follow like the roto world football account and it gave me the up-to-date information on all the injuries i feel like as long as i knew a little bit that would probably be enough like what do i do for soccer 
So soccer, uh, a good place to start is whoscored.com. It's ran by Opta, which is the stats provider for DraftKings. So all of the statistics you see on who scored are going to be the stats that are reflected on DraftKings scoring. Uh, so you can go to who scored. If you look at the previews tab, you'll be able to see previews for all the games in the World Cup, and it'll give you projected lineups. You can click on those players and see how often they score goals, see how often they cross the ball, see how often they pass the ball. Uh, a good place to start for DraftKings soccer is the more often a player dribbles the ball, the more often they touch the ball, the more often they pass the ball, the more likely they are to generate DraftKings points. So that's a, a really good place to start. Uh, I, that was where I started researching soccer when it became available on DraftKings in, I think, 2014. And I'll be honest with you, the process has not changed a ton since then. All right, so we're doing these three game slates, and we were talking a little bit off air on this. So I when golf first started, I crushed everyone at golf. And then people actually got good at golf and got way better than me. And then I became less good at golf. But there's always <laughs> these sports on DraftKings. Like, I bet you if you were really good at CFL, that you would just crush CFL every single week. It feels like, although soccer is bigger and the prize pools are much larger, it still feels like the actual player pool, especially like something for this, for the World Cup, where, you know, I'm going to play lineups and I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Uh, but I'm sure I'm not the only one who's going to be looking to play in some DraftKings tournaments for this. So strategy-wise, pure basics for a three-game slate in a GPP. What are the few things I should be looking out for right away? So soccer is a lot different from NFL, MLB, or golf tournaments. Actually, maybe a little bit similar to golf, but definitely not like NFL and baseball in the sense that there are some locks that truly it just makes no sense not to take in 100% of your lineups. Like, or maybe, maybe 90%, maybe 10%, you hope that um, the lock gets injured, right? <laughs> or, or something like kind of horrific happens. But in soccer, for example, not in this first slate um, where, you know, Ronaldo is against Spain and he's actually uh, like a terrible play. And I will not have him in one slate single of my lineups for the opening slate. I don't even know how many tickets I have to the opening GPP. Um, but for when he plays his group match against Iran, he will be such a stone lock that no matter how many lineups you're putting in, he just needs to be in every one. And the, the player that that is true for in this opening slate is the Moroccan midfielder, Hakim Zayek. He takes all of their corner kicks he takes all of their set pieces, which is when uh, the ball is – the play is whistled dead for a foul, and the uh, attacking team sends in a cross into the opposing – Okay, well, hold, 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 hold on a second. Like, I, I don't know much about soccer. I'm not like a moron, though. <laughs> there are some people listening to this who may have not ever watched a game who don't know what a set piece is, and that's <laughs> – you generate a ton of points from set pieces. That's like the main way to get – DraftKings points. Okay, so so the Moroccan midfielder, what's his name? Hakim uh, Zayek. He's eighty seven hundred. He takes all of their corner kicks and all of their uh, set pieces. Yeah, so, so all of their direct free kicks. Okay, so if you're fading Ronaldo, then and we look at this chart here for all the midfielders. Like when we're going through it, like where do you like punt and save money? So if, if I take him, then I have Zayek. You said his name was. Yeah, he's eighty seven hundred. He might not even be on your first board. Oh, no. I, it, he's there. He's he, there. He's right he's right there. below Isco. All right. So I have $5,900 left. Like, where do I find the scrubs to fill in here? Like, do I just punt goalkeeper? Is that, that the move? So punting goalkeeper is actually, that's just, I just do that all the time anyways. It just ends up making sense because what you will learn about DraftKings goalkeepers is that the expensive ones are basically either going to get two points or 12 points because they won't generate very many points from saves. So really they're generating all of their value from getting a clean sheet and a win. But if they lose that clean sheet, their upside is really low. Whereas the cheap goalkeepers, like the Egyptian goalkeeper against Uruguay, for example, his range of outcomes is probably anywhere from minus four to like 25. Because if they keep a clean sheet and Uruguay is, you know, chasing them for a lot of this game, he could save eight shots, which generates into 16 points. So for tournaments, it does make sense to go with the cheap goalkeeper. And for cash games, it does as well. And uh, 
a big tournament strategy is going to be correlation between your goalkeepers and your defenders. So for example, um, if you, if you did take the Uruguayan goalkeeper, Fernando Muslera, you would also probably want to take, you know, a couple of his defenders because then when the line, you know, if they, if they beat Egypt 2-0, the game's going to end and you're going to get 15 bonus points from those three players. Okay. So that's the correlation stack that we're looking for here. That's a huge correlation stack. And I assume a lot of the winning GBP lineups over the next month in the World Cup will be, it will be surprise clean sheets. So like, for example, if Iran was able to keep Morocco from scoring, they're pretty big underdogs in that game. The Moroccan goalkeeper or or the Iranian goalkeeper and the Iranian defenders, they're going to have a ton of points and they're, you know, available for relatively lower prices. All right. So if we don't take Ronaldo, what do we do up front then? Like it just, not even for this slate specifically, but like, do you always take, like, anytime one of the studs is playing some garbage team, and we're going to see it like Saudi Arabia is in this tournament, just absolute loser countries in terms of soccer that are going to go up against the best guys in the world. Like, I, it, I guess it works twofold. If the game is close, they're not going to come out. And if the game is a blowout, they probably have all the goals. So, like, are, are those the types of locks that you're looking for? In, in the World Cup, just the way it functions, pretty the subs you're going to be worried about are going to be, like, midfielders. But, like, Ronaldo probably won't sub out in any game in the World Cup. Messi probably won't sub out in any game in the World Cup. Antoine Griezmann might sub out for France, but it's pretty unlikely. Like, these guys, this is what they train for. This is their whole lives. They, they don't want to come out. Uh, so, for example, in this slate, Ronaldo, I just don't even really think he's worth considering. I would either go 100% Ronaldo in this opening tournament or I would have him in zero because I think this is this is probably the worst matchup he'll have until the semifinal or the final of the World Cup if Portugal gets there. But the next two guys, Luis Suarez and Edinson Cavani, they actually have a great matchup against Egypt. Egypt is like a decent defensive team, but they're horrible on offense, so they're not going to have very much of the ball. So Suarez and Cavani are going to have a ton of chances to shoot. And for the tournament... Um, I would assume Suarez will be like 10 to 20% more owned than Cavani will because he's better. He takes a lot of the direct free kicks and people are more aware of who Luis Suarez is. Like if you're, if you're just someone, if you're, if if you're me, I know who that is. (laughs) Right. You know, you know, he's never heard of this other guy. (laughs) Yeah. He bit, he bit the guy, right? Like that's him. All right. So what about Salah then? Is he actually going to play? So from what I understand, he's not going to play this first game against Uruguay, but he's expected to be available for the next two games, which means that Egypt, is they're just going to be really bad in this game. Like, they're, they're just going to get wrecked. They, I don't really think they stand any chance of even scoring in this game. All right, so... Huh, that's a, I mean, this really set up well for them that they're playing the best team in the group in game one. You can rest them for as long as possible. Yeah, and then right. I actually move on. think... It, I actually think if they got to choose one game for him to miss, they would choose this game and then bring him in against Saudi Arabia and against Russia and just hope that he's able to convert, you know, one goal in those games because that probably makes them a favorite. All right. Strategy wise, anything else that I really need to know? Just basics like who are my floor guys that I'm looking for? These midfielders who get crosses and potentially take set pieces? Yeah. So the the general lineup build in DraftKings soccer that ends up winning is you'll have one or two studs who is the main set piece taker and goal threat for their teams. You'll find one really cheap midfielder. And a lot of times who that guy is, is going to be a defensive midfielder for a team that kind of gets forward a little bit. And maybe he takes a corner here or there. Maybe he likes to shoot from 30 yards out. You're not expecting much from a midfielder from three to 4,000, maybe six points. Um, some teams, they're not in this slate we're looking at. There are not any great defenders in this slate, so it's easier to go cheaper. But in a lot of slates, there will be defenders who do put in a decent amount of crosses, and you'll go one expensive, one cheap, cheap goalkeeper, and then kind of a, a 6K-ish guy in util. Obviously, that doesn't apply to every slate, but that's kind of – general roster construction that i see a lot in contests on DraftKings. well since these games are spread out um do you just put the guy in the latest game in the util spot for a late swap if you need it again i haven't you know that's kind of a slate by slate thing but that's a really interesting wrinkle that's going to come into play for these games that we've not really seen massive gpps on DraftKings happen for games that are all spread out like this kind of the last time we had it was the european championships in 2016 and people botched that every slate. <laughs> every every slate, people were not prepared. 
They, um, you know, they didn't have an idea of who was going to be starting and who wasn't in the next game. They weren't monitoring injuries. And soccer is this massively global phenomenon. So if you want to find that information, trust me, you can. Like, where, there are projected where, lineups. Where, 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 projected lineups are one thing, but like when lineups come out, where do I find them? Uh, I have a list on Twitter that has all of them. If you guys want to do that, that's what, that's what I use. If you just go, click on my profile, you click on lists. I have a list called Soccer DFS. You click on that an hour before any game comes out, and you'll find that information. Um, if you don't want to go through all of that, I'm sure the FIFA website will have it. I'm sure who scored – like, this information is readily available with a quick Google search. Who, who are, like, the DFS – who are the DFS soccer guys besides you to follow? I wouldn't even really consider myself a DFS soccer guy. You, I, you pay attention to it. That makes you a DFS sure, soccer guy. Sure, yeah. Uh, the old fantasy insiders, uh, lead soccer guy, uh, Luis Pacheco. He's, he's kind of who I would trust the most. He'll have a lot of information on Twitter. Um, there, I think on Roto grinders, they have some stuff in the marketplace, but I don't actually know who is in charge of it. I'll be honest with you. There's not a ton of DFS soccer content out there. The Roto wire guys actually do a great job. If you, if you subscribe to Roto wire, you'll get a lot of information. They'll have, um, Rotowire will actually have the information on corner kicks and uh, set piece is taken over the course of the tournament. They have a they'll have a cheat sheet that'll come out the morning of uh, a lot of these tournaments. So I would actually start with the Rotowire soccer guys. Uh, Andrew Laird, uh, he he does a lot of it. I'll give I'll give him props. He that's the information I use the most often. All right, let's talk games. Let's start with Spain and Portugal uh, and the DFS ramifications of all of this uh, from this game. Is this going to be a game that you target here because it's probably not going to be projected for the most points no so this game this game is brutal because of how spain plays so this will actually be a a thing that differentiates the people that follow soccer from the people that are just kind of learning it and picking it up for the first time spain is going to be massive favorites in a lot of these games they're going to be like they're going to be like two goal favorites and they suck for dfs they suck so hard they don't do anything that generates the peripheral points. So if you if you look at their roster, you know they have Diego Costa. He's very good. Their midfielder is full of like Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester City. These amazing players. Um, their defenders are very good. They they don't cross the ball, which you get points for. They do not shoot very often. They do not get tackles. So if I was playing twenty lineups in this thing. I, I would just I would not take anyone from this game outside of maybe defenders because I think the chance for fantasy points to be generated in this game are so low. All right, so if I was playing, who, who are some of, who are some of the defenders that we should be looking at like if you were going to jump into this game and look at the defenders? Who would be the defenders to look at? Uh, Jordi Alba for uh, Spain. He he used to be a winger when he was younger, when he was like in his early twenties. So he he tends to just get a little bit more forward. He he drifts forward just more naturally and also i would i would take a spain center back just because i do think they keep a clean sheet and um the difference between a fullback and a center back is the fullbacks are involved in the attacking center backs stay back they just do defense but in international tournaments like this where a lot of these games are going to be low scoring because so many of these teams are going to be playing tight i actually think playing a center back becomes much more viable than it would in a league and for Portugal, uh, Rafael Guerrero, he was injured for a lot of uh, his league season, but he also used to be a winger, and he's just like a very attacking player. I could, if if Portugal does score, I can easily see him being involved. So he would make like my tournament shortlist. Guerrero and Alba would, but still not like super targets. Yeah, and they're only fifty one and five thousand dollars too. So you're not like, I mean, the highest priced defender is only 5500 where like what's a good score do you think for this because i know these slates are going to be different uh, as yeah. opposed to like a giant premiership slate or anything like that but what do you think would be a cashable score on this slate yeah, i mean it would definitely depend on the amount of goals and actually the amount of clean sheets really clean sheet it's crazy how much they end up influencing the slate like if one really popular defensive tandem like say for example morocco keeps a clean sheet against uh, Iran. So you have the Moroccan goalkeeper and uh, Ashraf Hakimi for for Morocco. They both keep a clean sheet. That makes the cash line probably go up four points in this slate because of how popular that tandem is going to be. 
But I would say if you're getting 2.5 X on salary for any of your guys, that's probably a good, that's like a, that's like a good target. All right. So like if a midfielder, like if a defender scores 10 points, that's like, that's pretty good. 10 without a clean sheet for a defender is like really good. Okay. But but with a clean sheet, you'd want more. Yeah. With a clean sheet, you'd be hoping for 13, 14, but I mean, Defender scoring in double digits outside of getting an assist or a goal is not incredibly common, even in league soccer, which is generally more offensive. All right, so in this game, uh, the over-under is two and a half for goals scored. And to bet the over is plus 130. So they're really trying to entice you. They're, they're propping up the over for people to pound it. So, I mean, just outside of the guys that you mentioned, like you said, this is just a stay-away game? It's a stay-away just because um, oh, Spain is... It, yeah, Spain. There's just Spain is just better, and they kill the game flow for daily fantasy. I would say if I was going to play someone for Spain, it would be whoever when they release their lineup comes out. Whoever is playing behind the striker in the attacking midfield position, whether it be David Silva or Isco, that that would be the guy that I would be most likely to take um, for daily fantasy. If I was making 20 lineups, I would include that guy for sure. All right, so let's get to a game where it's a similar number of over-under in terms of goals, two and a half, Morocco versus Iran. I mean, is Iran even any good? Like, is Morocco any good? Morocco is actually good, yeah. They they have, so in the Moroccan starting lineup, they're they're basically all... They all play in the top five leagues in Europe. Um, they have they have a guy who plays for Real Madrid at defense, uh, Hakimi. Uh, Ziek plays in the Dutch Eredivisie, and he's he's very solid. And some of their attacking midfielders, uh, Carcella, Carcella Gonzalez and Fekal Fijar, both very solid attacking options. I probably am not super interested in taking whoever starts at striker for them, just because I think it's more likely to kind of be creative team play that generates their goals. But, and I actually don't even know who is confirmed to start at striker for them. They, the lineup I'm looking at right now has uh, Khalid Butab projected to start at forward, but yeah, I'm not going to. And he, he's the most expensive guy in this game at forward at forward is he's 7,200 bucks. Like where, where do you think like the chalk ends up going at forward? Do you think people just take Ronaldo? Cause they know Ronaldo. They, that will be the, so like in the, what what does it cost? Enter twenty dollars. So in the twenty, Ronaldo will probably be there. But in all the ones that they didn't do tickets for, so the ones where you actually have to buy in, I assume the chalk at forward is going. It will be hundred percent. It will be Luis Suarez, and then the second guy um, actually might be the guy who plays for Iran, and his name is his name is tough. But I'm gonna go for it. Go for it's, it. it. It's Ali Yahan Kabash. That's good. That's that's got to be close. He's uh he's sixty seven hundred or sixty two hundred rather, and he actually had a great year in the same league that Hakim Zayek did. He had he basically did the same thing that Hakim did. Just you know loads loads of crosses, loads of shots. He did. He just did a, a very good job, and uh, he's he's pretty reasonably priced. You know Morocco is good, but they're not Spain good. They're not going to dominate Iran to the point that they're unable to get any shots off. All right, so it, for targets in this game, uh, if you know you, you don't want to take the forwards, other midfielders, other defenders, goalkeepers potentially here uh, that you'd be interested in. Well, oh, another thing I need to mention is that punting your second forward in these international tournaments. I've done this in World Cup qualifiers and in the Euro 2016. Just taking the cheapest available forward at who the plays? second spot. Who plays? Who plays? Yeah, and, and, because... and then you can luck sack into a goal. Right, because forwards, you would expect that that the point generation, your your point expectation at forward would be the highest. It's actually not true because forwards, a lot of the times, do not generate the peripheral points. It's either a goal or they get zero points or two points. And so if you wanted to take the, the guy who starts at striker for Iran, which could be you know, there are guys who are five or, or there are guys who are like 5k projected to start at, you know, straight up striker for Iran. And I don't think that's like horrible just because likely you're going to be having to make some suboptimal decisions, some poor choices at certain spots and just hoping for a goal. And I, I don't think Morocco is so great that Iran will not be able to move the ball. Okay. Um, who do you think wins this game? Obviously Morocco. Do you think it goes over the two and a half goals? 
Mm, I think I think Morocco definitely. I actually bet Morocco to advance from this group over Portugal at uh, plus three twenty five. I think Morocco is pretty good, but uh, their strength is not in their defense. It's just that their attack is all they all play you know, major European soccer. All right, final game on this slate, Uruguay and Egypt. Is this, uh, you may you mentioned Suarez probably ends up being the guy who's the highest known. Is, are the Uruguayan team where people are going to concentrate a lot of their lineups? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the, they're a big favorite on this slate. People know about Uruguay, basically. Like, that's a, that's a huge thing. They recognize these names. And Uruguay is pretty good. Like defensively, they're very stout. Where they actually they have troubles, as in the midfield. Uh, n- none of their midfielders are any good. They don't they don't play in England. They don't play in Spain. So it's all it's all forward attacking talent. And then their their defense is actually really stout. Like a, if you can find a, uh, well, there's actually definitely a bet for Uruguay to win to nil. Whatever the odds are on that, that's a fantastic bet. Well, uh, I'm gonna try to find. You keep talking. I'm gonna find that bet right now. Yeah, uh, I would. I probably would not play Diego Laxalt unless he is starting in uh, an attacking position. He's listed at defense, and we'll actually probably see this a couple times throughout the tournament, where just due to injuries or whatever else is going on in a team, someone who's listed at defense will get uh, pushed up the field, and in the tactical formation that's released, they'll be starting at winger or at wide midfielder. Defense. I would actually, I would actually take Martin uh, Casares, who's forty one hundred for Uruguay. The reason he's priced like that is for his club team Lazio, he plays center back. But for his national team, just due to the requirements of what's going on, he plays right back. So he's more likely to get forward, more likely to generate crosses. And if he does start over uh, Pereira, uh, Maxi Pereira, I think forty one hundred. If he starts it right back in this first game against Egypt, he will be the highest owned player at defense, 100%. Okay, so I'm on Bet365 looking at this right now. I'm trying to find a clean sheet, but I don't even really know what I'm looking for. They have a slider where you can just project the game, the actual results of the game. Um, Sure. And if you do that, it increases the odds. So if I take Uruguay 2-0, it's 5-1. If I take Uruguay 3-0, it's 10-1. I would... Two, two zero, at five hundred. Yeah, that's good. But they, I know on Bovada they do, they do win to nil. But I, I'm sure it's on here somewhere. But there's like eight thousand bets on the screen. I don't yeah, exactly know what they all mean. <laughs> that's the thing is these these sites, all betting sites, they know like this is their prime time. Any everyone and their mothers placing bets on the World Cup. So actually, there are soft odds on a lot of good bets if you just kind of look because there are also a lot of terrible odds on things that will just never happen, and right. people will bet them anyway. All right, looking at this from a full slate perspective, let's start with forwards, uh, and we're going to cross off Ronaldo. You're going to be using Suarez as your expensive guy at forward? Yeah, and also, I mean, I think Cavani is just as playable. He generates less scoring chances for the national team than Suarez does, but he has the exact same matchup. He'll be playing in the exact same position just across. And and, and, and you're going to get him at an ownership discount too. Yeah, and he's also very good. He is the leading goal scorer in PSG's history, the same club that Zlatan Ibrahimovic played for. He's he's great. Like He's just a very good player. So, so who, who would be the punt guy here, do you think? So if Inesri, Youssef Inesri, he is 6,700. If he starts uh, on the wing against Iran, he will probably generate a, a good amount of ownership. Uh, Yahan, Yahan Bakish, if he's, he will start for Iran, he's probably playable in all formats um, with set pieces against uh, Iran. Bernardo Silva, I, if I was going to play a forward from Portugal, he would be the guy I would probably play because he'll start at a wide midfielder position and uh, will be able to get some crosses in. And then if you if you just want to punt, if you want to take uh, an Iranian forward, uh, you know, 4,300, if any of those guys start, uh, Gados or Guhanijad, that's definitely not the right pronunciation. But uh, either oh, of those the, guys uh, can, we, can we just call this guy the Gooch? Reza, the Gooch? Yeah, Yeah, sure. the, the Gooch. Reza Gooch. Chanijad. Yeah. I, I, I like it. If he starts, I'm playing him. I think even if the if this slate goes to what the posted Vegas totals are, and you start Suarez, who scores one goal and maybe gets like three shots off and he has like 18 points, and then you start one Iranian forward who is like 
close to the dead man and he plays 70 minutes and he gets three points, I still think there's a chance that if you get the other pieces right, that ends up being the winning lineup in the $20, 30K to first tournament. All right, well, what, what do we do with some of these forwards that also have midfielder eligibility? Is that like, I mean, you just mentioned that with, uh, I forgot who you said, Marino, was that who it was? It's no, 60... but uh, uh, Inesri, but he doesn't, uh, oh, Bernardo Silva. Bernardo Silva so at general... 61, yeah. Here's a here's a general rule for you to learn. Okay. Um, guys who have midfield forward eligibility are always going to be better plays at forward because it changes the point expectation for that slot in your roster. Forwards generally only gain points one way through scoring goals. Your out and out strikers do, but guys who are midfield forward eligible are likely to play wide midfield positions or kind of rotate between the two. And so they take shots, they get crosses, they win tackles, they get interceptions, and they just have more ways to generate points, which is, you know, you can't count on goals. So generating peripheral points is a huge way, obviously, of, you know, winning tournaments. And so if a guy has midfield forward eligibility, you probably don't want to waste him on a midfield slot. No, but but would those be some forwards to target then? Yeah, I mean, I'm really staying away from the Spanish guys, but... I guess, for example, if uh, Rodrigo Moreno does start at striker in the first game for Spain, I don't think he will. I'm pretty sure Diego Costa will. But at 7,700, he would be he would be the guy who's most likely to score a goal for Spain, who is you know a favorite on this slate, and he probably he probably should just be priced the same as Diego Costa. Okay, let's go to the midfielders then. If uh, Salah is at the top at 9,300, he's probably not going to play, so probably not him. And then there's a guy with one name. That's always fun. Isco. Well, he he actually has like 19 names. He just shortens it so that pe- for branding reasons. Ah, see, you gotta you gotta he, respect the branding. I I mean the, these soccer guys like the basketball players, top notch at branding. Like they're, yeah. I I think out of the two segments of the sporting world, like they're the best at it. Oh, it's not even close. Soccer players are so good at it, and they play the media so well. But uh, Isco plays for Real Madrid. He had, like, the best season of his career this last year. I actually expect he probably will be the primary playmaker for Spain. It's just that he's overpriced for this game, and especially because Ziyech is the best play. Ziyech should be more expensive. He's not. Uh, He's a really good play. At the secondary midfielder position, I actually think the move is to find uh, a much cheaper player, you know, kind of one of those more defensive-minded midfielders. And there's a, a weird DraftKings issue here where they have this guy, Nabil Durar, priced at 4300 And the projected lineup I have for Morocco shows him projected to start at right back. So normally you would think, oh, well, midfielders will score more than defenders, but right right back with Durar's skill set is going to mean he's like definitely underpriced at 4300 I would expect him to put in three or four crosses maybe get a shot or two off and like you know he's already at six points basically and does have you know a decent chance of of generating some kind of scoring chance so he's kind of a, a cheap guy that I'm looking at all of the Moroccan guys actually uh Youssef Bel- uh Younes Belhanda the same he uh could start on the wing opposite uh, of Ziek and would make him uh, a good play as well. And if you weren't confused enough, <laughs> Morocco has Morocco has two guys with the last name of Amrabat. I don't know if they're brothers. I don't know if they're related. <laughs> but, but one of them is 5,700. That's Nordin Amrabat. And then Sofyan Amrabat is 3,100. If Sofyan Amrabat starts at 3,100 on the wing for Morocco, he will be... I would put him in a hundred percent of 150 lineups. So, so he, he he would become the running back who is all of a sudden getting all the carries Sunday morning because the starter is just a late scratch and he's like three thousand bucks. Yeah. So the the equivalent to that for from football to soccer is, um, you know, like the the twentieth guy who got brought to the World Cup if he gets has to start in an attacking position due to injuries or due to a change in tactical formation. And he's you know 3200, 4400 or whatever for a favored team. That's the equivalent to you know Spencer Ware getting the start on Sunday morning because Kareem Hunt got hurt. All right, defenders. Um, man, these names. Silva. Should I just take Silva? I can pronounce that one. 
Gaston Silva. Yeah, I think the Uruguayan fullbacks are the best plays. They're who I would project to score the most points, to generate the most crosses, to have the best chance of getting an assist. But uh, uh, Ashraf Hakimi, who is 5,300, he's from Morocco. He also plays at a club level for Real Madrid and probably would be the primary starter there if uh, Daniel Carvajal was not the normal starter. He's probably the best individual play. The Spanish fullbacks, I, I mentioned Alba. Outside of him, they don't do anything. They don't cross. I actually think I'm I'm in this slate. I think some of the center backs are in play, like the Egyptian center backs who are really cheap. Uh, Ahmed Hagazi, uh, Mahmoud Hamdi. Like I, I think that playing center backs in these large tournaments is not terrible because there's not a ton of opportunity cost in this particular slate, just because none of these defenders have, have corner kick duty for their national teams. So you're not going to be fading a guy who has like 15 point peripheral upside. We'll, we'll get to like an England slate in this tournament and England's fullbacks take the corner kicks for their national team. So Trent Alexander, Arnold, Danny Rose, they take the corner kicks so they could get up to 10 DraftKings points without scoring a point without a clean sheet at all that's not overly likely in this slate so i kind of think if you check on friday morning projected lineup starting lineups if first of all if you find martin caser starting out right back for uruguay he becomes a, a great play there on friday morning outside of that there's not anyone that really leaps out as like you know a great play that you have to get in all right goalkeepers to finish this off for this slate of picks uh you said good spot to punt yeah goalkeepers is just more about strategy and it's more about um it's more about correlating to the rest of your lineup so say you are just straight fading spain in like 10 lineups well obviously it would make sense if you're straight fading spain you take the portuguese goalkeeper because the correlation there if spain gets shut out randomly you know if that happens you have this massive leverage on the rest of the competition that will have spanish players and you'll have the portuguese goalkeeper so not only are are all these other lineups dead but you're getting this giant benefit in in uh return of points from saves from the clean sheet and maybe even the potential win uh if you're creating lineups where you're fading uruguay obviously it makes sense to take the um egyptian goalkeeper if you're creating lineups that's fading morocco you take the iranian goalkeeper and if you're just creating a mismatch of all of them, um, I mean, my my favorite play would probably be the Iranian goalkeeper just because I think he'll face the most shots with actual a chance of, like, saving them and actual chance of his team winning the game. You, you, mean, uh, he, you mean Ali Reza, Briar Andavad? Yeah, I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't going to, I was going <laughs> to leave that one to you. It's easier to just say the Egyptian goalkeeper. Oh, no, that was the Iranian goalkeeper. Oh yeah, the Iranian goalkeeper. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, the uh, the Egyptian goalkeeper right now, thirty nine hundred is Mohammed Al Shinawe. Yeah, it do, but it doesn't it doesn't make sense to make goalkeepers part of your core play. That's one where you kind of just need to uh, what, whatever you it, have left in salary, basically. Whatever you have left in salary, or base it on what you've done with the rest of your lineup. Like if you're straight up sacking Spain, you don't want to put the Portuguese goalkeeper in there. It doesn't and, make much sense. And you say the correlation is to play the defenders with the goalkeeper that you take generally. Like you don't have to, but that's like a stat. Yeah, you don't you have do. to, but that's a good correlation play. Yeah. All right. So uh, are any of these guys starters for their teams like Bono for Morocco? Uh no, he so <laughs> he a lot like if the rule is that every team has to bring three goalkeepers. Okay. So, so they just but, decided, like, hey, let's put Bono on the team. Good press for us. Yeah. Uh, but basically, basically, the one who is the most expensive of these three guys is generally the starter unless someone is injured. But, again, that'll be confirmed for you 60 minutes before uh, lineup lock oh, on so, all of these so, sites. But, yeah. So that means I'm not going to see any Beto for Portugal or Patricio? Mm, you could. Actually, I think Portugal is a team that rotates. I think they move between Patricio and Lopez. Okay. So okay. Okay. So that's this slate. What do we do for like when we get to the knockout stage when penalty kicks are in play? How are penalty kicks even scored? They're not. Okay. Once, so if a game goes 120 minutes and it goes to penalty kicks, it's the well, the win is scored for the goalkeeper that wins, I believe. 
All right, so it's like golf. You don't get any more birdie points for golf. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just you get your winning points. And actually, someone loses 10 points because they don't have winning points anymore. Yeah, that's exactly what happens, except it's not taken away. I kind of wish DraftKings did it that way, where every defender and goalkeeper started out with a clean sheet at least, because <laughs> it would help you have a better sense of where you were, but they don't. It's waited to be added in until the end. Uh, it's like all the like all the bonus, like the 100. I guess if you get the 100-yard bonus in football, they tack it on right away, don't they? It's, it's like in golf where you have to wait until the very end for the four rounds under 70 or okay. whatever. All right, so what do we do for showdown slates? Do you play many of those? I Let me tell you this. <laughs> I love showdown. <laughs> okay. And I, I wanted to hate it, and I hate it for, like, baseball and basketball. I haven't tried it for football yet, obviously. Um, I hate it, and I think it's, like, the, the a bad direction to, to be going. Like, it, there's a ton of variance in it. But people are horrible at soccer showdown right now. <laughs> they're 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 so bad at it. Like uh, playing a goalkeeper in showdown is like horrendously moronic because they just they cannot generate enough points to ever be worth their salary. They would have to get like ten saves with a clean sheet and a win to to generate enough points to be worth it. Uh, showdown is pretty easy. There are some guys who. You know, they'll be pri- like Neymar will be priced at like 17,000 in showdown, and he's probably worth it because with that scoring, he can generate like 100 points, like realistically can generate 100 points. And other than that, you just take underpriced central midfielders, you take the outside fullbacks, the ones who cross and get defensive stats and have clean sheet upside, and you, you just don't take strikers. Out and out strikers are just horrible plays in showdown 80% of the time because. Even if they score a goal, they can still easily be outscored by a central midfielder who just c- contributes in every category. So defense, so five thousand cheaper. So midfielders in showdown, just target them. Midfielders in showdown, um, and and the outside fullbacks, the guys who the guys who defend from the outside are just the best plays. And never take a goalkeeper. I mean, maybe one out of ten slates, the way the salaries could work out, maybe it's viable. But in general, if you if if I play you in a head to head and showdown and you turn over the most expensive strike if you turned over Edinson Cavani and the Uruguay goalkeeper against me in showdown, I would like send you an invite to be my friend on drafting <laughs> so that I could play you more often. <laughs> is that it's why is, like, is that why people do that for me? <laughs> they don't, I mean, I don't know. They, they don't they don't want to be my friend? I, the only reason I would ever send someone a friend invite on DraftKings is because I wanted to play them again. That's awesome. All right, let's talk uh, just general World Cup thoughts. Who do you think is going to win? It seems like you're going Team France here. Actually, I don't because um, their manager is is a, such a goof. He he's, <laughs> he's like he just doesn't make the right strategic decisions, and he's not going to deploy the 23 players they have in like the most game theory optimal way. They have like um, the best midfielder in the world. And he doesn't use his skill set to their advantage, and it's like it's a bummer. So I, I actually think Brazil wins. Uh, a lot of people want or are backing Germany to win. Ba- basically, the people, the reason people are fading Brazil is because they lost to Germany seven to one at the last World Cup in and, in like, Brazil. In Brazil, but basically none of those players are the same. And also, people forget that Neymar. That suffered like a horrible serious injury the game before that game he like had a fracture in his back so the, the team was just like super stressed about this whole thing and their whole offense is based around Neymar having the ball and like playmaking off of that Brazil is the best team in the tournament like for sure all right uh, outside of like the I mean I'm, I'm even lumping Belgium in here with this top six because they're under 10 to 1 in odds but like beyond that Anyone, not to say they're going to win, but, like, could make the semis or anything like that? Uh, Croatia at 33-1 to 1 and Colombia at 45-1 to 1 are both tickets that I have. Croatia has the top-end talent. You know, they have guys who play for Real Madrid, guys who play for Juventus, guys who play for Barcelona. And, you know, front to back, they have all very good players. And then Colombia is, like, what will happen in international soccer a lot is – because you can't go out and get a new player. You can't trade for a right back if you need one, right? So what will happen a lot of the times for these national teams is they'll be really, really solid at one area of the field, and then they'll have some guy who plays in the MLS <laughs> starting at this position just because that's the best they can do. Colombia is, other than Brazil, they're like the most complete South American team. They have one superstar. 
uh, James Rodriguez. And then front to back, they have all top end talent. It's all their starters are good above average, like in any league in the world starters. And 45 to one is too deep for them. So depth wise, they're better than Uruguay? Definitely, yes. Definitely better. I would I would put them like if Uruguay and Colombia were to play five times, I would expect Colombia to win three. Um, any value in betting draws in any of these games? Just straight up draws? <laughs> yes, definitely yes, because um and this will this will bum a lot of people out, <laughs> but the World Cup matters so much to these managers and to these players you can't even imagine. They they're playing these games with the tightest butts. You could like it's so stressful that playing for a draw is very realistic in a lot of these games. Like, it's just going to be very cautious, very defensive soccer a lot of the time. Who, who are the defensive teams that we should probably – I mean, I'm sure the books will catch up to it because they'll know, but I don't know. I just always assume Switzerland is always just trying to play defense, not even trying to score. Switzerland is horrible. If you can – that's a good spot. If you want to bet against Switzerland uh, in, some of their op- in some of their group games, Switzerland, I think, is like – even even at a hundred to one to win this tournament, I think they're overrated. I think they're I think they're really bad. Hey, in the FIFA rankings, they're inside the top ten. Yeah, I I do not. I because their their like best offensive player just had like his worst offensive season ever, and uh, sort of opposite of Colombia, they do have like a decent midfield, decent defense. The whole country can't produce a striker who can finish goals. All right, like they just they just can't finish. All right, well, what about like? Are, are there, like, upside high-scoring teams that are going to lose, like, 5-3? Like, does Mexico play any defense? Uh, no, Mexico, like, they'll be starting, like, a 39-year-old at center back, but their attacking <laughs> talent is pretty decent. Uh, and the, the same is true with a lot of the African teams. Senegal's defense is just okay, but their attack is uh, quite good. And Japan and uh, South Korea, their, their attacking talent, like, South Korea has, like, really high-end attacking talent japan japan is just like undersized like they play a very technical style of soccer really so against yeah 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 (laughs) so uh so a big uh attacking team like you know if they advance whatever they play against someone like germany uh someone like belgium like yeah bet the over in that game because they're just going to get smashed physically all right well my team is out of this they're not in the world cup which disappoints me because it's like the one thing that i root for to actually happen to give me some vested interest so I, I Canada? Yeah, Canada. The the one time they made it, I don't think they scored. <laughs> I, I think we might actually we're putting in a joint bid with you guys. So we'll have to be yeah, in for, for and, 2026. And, and just get embarrassed off the pitch. No, I am I'm all Dutch when it comes to this because like they're usually pretty good. And they yeah, were they, they're, they're they, horrible they were, right now. Yeah, they, they were good when I was growing up. I was just like, this is great. My grandmother's from Holland. Like, the, the, this is what I'm latching onto to have any invested rooting interest in soccer. But they're out, so I need something else. So like, should I just bet on Colombia and root for Colombia? Um. Well, I I you know my family comes from Germany, long time. Uh, so I, that's always who I've rooted for. I've I never thought, cared. I always thought your family came from Senegal. You know, uh, it, my family, my my mom's side's from Germany. My dad's side's from the Czech Republic. True story. Anyone in the United States with my same last name is blood related to me or married marriage related to me because it uh, it was a, a an Ellis Island fib that like my great great grandfather told. He changed our last name when we got here. So anyone with the last name of Matic is related to me. What what was it? It was like it was you know some super Czech name like with, with a lot of Z's and a lot of K's. There, there was a, it was like Matt Zek or something like that. I don't. I have like my grandma did like a whole ancestry research on it. But yeah, anyone like the 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 woman's tennis player who is like really good. She won the gold medal in doubles uh, at the last Olympics. Bethany Matic Sands. She's like my third cousin. Ah, see so you need to get in there you need to get some gold medal like how did you not get invited to the olympics then well we've all I, we only met at like a family reunion like one time i think i was probably like 11 ah, okay um any final world cup thoughts golden boot anything like that yeah actually i do have a, a golden a golden boot bet uh obviously what you need for a golden boot is for a team to, to go to deep. play play a lot of games are you taking someone yeah. from croatia no. Well, yes. Actually, I have a bet on Mario Mandzukic. I think it was at 100 to 1 um, because that if they go that far, for sure, he'll win it because he's like their main goal scoring threat. But a guy I actually think can win it, Antoine Griezmann, I do think France will at least make the semifinal. 
And if they do, he will have a lot of goals. And he's, this is maybe the first case ever of this, Bovada having better odds than Pinnacle or anywhere else. He's like 12 to one to win the golden boot on Bovada versus like six to one on, uh, on bet three, six, five and Pinnacle, I think. Can I let you in on a little secret about France? They like to give up. No. Do, do you know who their biggest supporter is? Don't. It's not. It is. Uh, well, all right, never mind. <laughs> just just bet on just bet on Messi for the golden boot then. Even at even at like seven to one, he's good. I, I think Tim Andercast owns like four French national team jerseys. <laughs> it's so brutal, man. That's because I mean, that's the, that right there. They're just, they're not going to make the final. Honestly, it could very easily be Germany, Brazil again. They are the two best teams. Although Germany, every time I look at their roster, I'm just like, I don't know who the primary guy who's going to score goals is. All right. Davis Maddock, follow him on Twitter at Davis Maddock and uh, pump the take cast once again. Yeah. The take cast, you can find it anywhere. It's, it's take spelled T A E K. Yeah. Like how take is spelled. Yeah, because it's uh, it's the podcast is really all about being extremely online and not being able to log off, and that's a very insular Twitter joke. And uh, yeah, there's a, been a lot of really good stuff. Uh, people people seem to like it. People seem to like uh, the babbling about being extremely online. So yeah, check it out. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And, yet, and Mayo's going to be on soon. Soon, and it probably won't be super fantasy related. Were people pumped for Silva? People were pumped for Silva. People were people were very shocked. I got Grant Wall from Sports Illustrated on. That was pretty cool. I didn't think he was going to do it. I just sent him a direct message. He, for some reason, has open DMs as a guy with that many Twitter followers. God bless him. Do, do you have open DMs? I had to get rid of open DMs. So I have it set where you have to request the ability to DM me. Uh-huh. So I can see what you say, but you can't see that I saw it. So really... I only I only ever uh, accept the DM when someone is trying to be nice. Yeah, see, I, I use the DM a lot for communication. Like, we're trying to, like, book this show. I'll DM yeah. you, and we'll figure it out that way. When I had them open to be, like, football season, then I'd have 5,000 messages. Do I start this guy or this guy? I was, see, just, I was just, I, I just like, you're just clocking up my thing. <laughs> Never, never one time have I ever responded to a start sit or anything via DM. Yeah, but I mean, I, I wasn't responding to it either, but it would just take up my entire page that I couldn't find what I actually needed to find. So I had to close it. I, I got, I've gotten like multiple paid jobs via having open DMs, so I will probably never close them. I, I got some really great advice for it on it one time too. Someone sent me, um, this was years ago. What the hell was the name of the site? Draft Day? That was a site, right? Yeah, draft day was that was where your guest got his start in daily fantasy. That was where I got my seed money. Really? So there was a thing, and some guy DM me at like two o'clock in the morning one time. This was before I was married, so of course I was up. Um, so I went and looked at. It. He's like, "Yeah, they had sort of like they had. It was like a parlay card that they had, but they scored it by fantasy points for golf." And it was like head-to-heads, and you could multiply it up anytime you want. So if you played like two head-to-heads, like a general parlay, it was that. But they never kept up with it. So like guys would withdraw, but they would still have the games on the slate and not take them off. So the, yeah. the guy hit me up one time. And I think it was it may have been for the St. Jude because so many people withdraw from the St. Jude because they qualify for the U.S. Open yeah. and then pull out. That like the entire slate, there, there was like six game or six head-to-heads on the slate. And three of them had guys yeah, withdraw. Yeah, the rapid fire was the best. Yeah, it was the rapid fire. So I was just like, boom, 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 all my money. Let's go. Yeah. It was fantastic. So yeah, open, day, open DMs day, is oh. a great thing. <laughs> yeah, open DMs. Open DMs has, as I will 100% say, has enriched my life, has made my experience on this earth better by giving me more money. Hey, and it's a great way to meet new people. Just sometimes. Other times, it's the worst way to meet new people. <laughs> and I get, I get good feedback on stuff, too. Like people have already like said a couple things about the show that are like, hey, do this. They're like, yeah, a lot of times it's helpful. Do you do you think that? Guy, I know a lot of people are listening to it now. Do you think it's just industry people that are listening to it, or do you think like the audience is growing wider and wider? Oh, it's just industry people right now because I I haven't nailed uh, a really good guest to like get the link out there to people that are not already in my little like consent. What, 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 what are you talking about? You have better guests than I do. I, I have like cussed on. Well, right, but it's already people that, like, even if I was just doing a solo show, 
like regardless of guests, they, it would be the same people listening to it. I don't think I'm bringing in people yet who are listening just for the guests. All right, well, we'll try this when I come on. So see if we can get it out to the peoples and all that. But in the meantime, subscribe to the TakeCast on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and all those places. But before you do that, subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience. Although, subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience. If you're listening to it, I assume you're subscribed already. So rate and review, that does go a long way. Like. I know that you probably hear it on every single podcast, and I'm not talking to you, Davis. I'm talking to the people right now. That it, it really helps. It, it really, actually, that's how people find this shit. So. It's like it's like it's just unbelievable how much it helps. I'm, you know, I'm kind of surprised you haven't started doing Patreon stuff yet. That's the move for all podcasters. Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, I have a big thing about my content being free. I'm not good. I, mean, I, I, I I'm not good enough at content that I would feel really bad if people had to pay for it. That is a great moral code to live by. Yeah, so I can give out the worst fucking picks in the world. You listen to some free guy on the internet. That's on you. <laughs> yeah, that's on you. For, yeah, but if you're <laughs> but if you're paying five dollars to hear you and Feinberg talk about golf, then it's a whole. Then you have moral responsibility to come through. Yeah, and then I actually like. I mean, I do do it every day, but then I would feel really obligated to do it all the time and make sure. I mean, I I, I do it anyway. So, and I do it for the free stuff to hit the marks every single day. But like, I, I feel bad about like going on vacation if people were paying for stuff. And then like, how do I even refund their money for that week? It's just, it's, I'd rather just do the show. Yeah, no, that's fair. And we work in an industry where you can't uh, do stuff beforehand, right? Like you couldn't record a week's worth of shows because you wouldn't have all the data. Oh, I highly disagree. Look at what sports do I cover, Davis? Oh, uh, I mean, fair enough. You could do, you can do golf stuff beforehand, but like, like baseball, football, basketball, you can't do that stuff. Oh, beforehand. football, football. Most definitely. I, I just went away on vacation and released five football shows in the summertime. It is the best sport. Oh yeah. In the summertime. Sure. Yeah. All right. PME, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, follow it on you know, all the podcast feeds, video feeds up on the DK YouTube page, dkplaybook.com, DK Live, all that fun stuff. Play these showdown slates. Play the DraftKings World Cup. It's going to be a lot of fun. And like David said, you got fish like me entering the, ga- entering the games, and it's not going to be just me. So if you're any good at this or know anything about soccer, apply what Davis just told you about strategy, and you're probably going to win. All right? I'm Pat Mayo. Enjoy the World Cup. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience. Experience.